What if you had to sleep through a night so cold it could freeze your eyelashes in seconds, without electricity, without heaters, and with nothing but snow all around you? At negative 64 degrees Celsius, negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit, even breathing feels risky, and yet, the Inuit do it. Not just surviving, but sleeping comfortably. How do they do it? The secret isn't just igloos, it's survival wisdom, honed over centuries. From self-heating snow caves to animal fur sleeping bags warmer than your heated blanket, let's uncover how the Inuit sleep at negative 64 degrees Celsius, negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit, without heat or power. You already know igloos are warm, but here's the kicker. A well-built igloo can be 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius warmer inside than outside. At negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit, that means negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit inside. This might sound brutal, but when outside is way colder than you can survive, inside an igloo becomes a warm haven. Without heaters or electricity, the Inuit are able to keep warm inside their homes with physics and centuries of genius. Snow offers more insulation than you'd think, especially since the Inuit use compacted snow rather than ice. It's 90% trapped air, making it 10 times more insulating than solid ice. In fact, snow's insulation power is better than the fiberglass batting used in houses today. Igloos are made in the form of a dome, and the spiral construction means there are no weak points, as each block locks into the next. With the dome shape, it evenly distributes wind force, so even gusts as fast as 100 miles per hour will flow around it, and not through it. As you might have seen in igloos, there's a cold trap entrance that looks like a low tunnel before rising into the main chamber. The cold air sinks into the tunnel, while warm air stays pooled in the dome. Some igloos also used a snow block as a door for extra insulation, keeping them warm as they sleep. Most Inuit families sleep together, because body heat can become a furnace. With two people sleeping together, it can raise temperatures without the need of any fire or electricity. Larger igloos can accommodate multiple people, and this causes body heat to go through the roof. It's like t-shirt weather, by Arctic standards. Igloos have to be constructed with a life-saving vent, which prevents CO2 buildup because, yes, you can actually suffocate in a sealed igloo. It also freezes moisture from breath, making the walls stronger overnight. For long stays, Inuit built quarmoks, which were windproof hybrids made of sod, stone, and bone. There is also snow piled against the walls for extra insulation. Explorers like Robert Peary survived nights in igloos, like the Inuit. Would you try it? Or you can't do without your electric blanket? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Forget the memory foam, the Inuit came up with the original cold weather sleep system. In the Arctic, sleeping directly on the ice is a death sentence. That's why the Inuit engineered the ultimate winter bed, a raised snow platform layered with furs. But why does the bed have to be raised? Heat rises and cold sinks in an igloo, so by sleeping high, they can enjoy the heat and avoid the heavy cold air that has sunk to the lower levels. Plus, the bed acts as a furniture bench by day and then a bed by night. It's usually about 12 to 24 inches tall, keeping sleepers in the warmest air pocket. To make the bed, the Inuit packs snow into a solid base, and it's strong enough to be a foam mattress. The snow's air pockets will slow down the heat transfer preventing conductive heat loss to the ground. Caribou hide is the ultimate insulator, as each hair is hollow, trapping body heat like a natural puffer jacket. Plus, it wicks moisture, which is very important as sweating in the freezing Arctic can lead to frostbite. They also make their bed with seal skin, a waterproof barrier that acts as the outer layer, blocking icy drafts. Basically, the bed is layered like a sandwich, with the bottom made of seal skin, the middle being caribou fur, and the top made of extra hides or woven grass mats. 
The Inuit bed also offers the opportunity for shared body heat, which becomes a natural furnace. The families sleep tightly packed together, and they place the kids at the center so they can get the most insulation. More bodies meant more heat, and the elders usually got extra furs, which kept them warmer than clothes for their old age. Sometimes entire families sleep close together in one igloo, although kids always have to move out when they grow up. In the Arctic, loneliness leads to hypothermia. Your camping cot would never survive in the Arctic, as metal conducts cold and the flat sleeping bags will lose heat. What's more, they are placed on the ground, making them a major frostbite risk. The Inuit also figured out a way to get warm that might just be better than your electric blanket, which is their sleeping bag. Before we got the synthetic fabrics and down fill in our $500 sleeping bag, the Inuit had already mastered the ultimate Arctic sleep system, the Paskak, which is a double-layered, self-heating, waterproof sleeping bag that is made from seal skin, caribou fur, and animal sinew. The sleeping bag has an outer shell made of seal skin, which naturally repels water. It's perfect for snow drifts and icy winds. It is also windproof, blocking gusts that would chill modern synthetics. And as long as they take care of it, it can last for decades. Then there's the inner lining made of caribou fur. Its hollow hairs trap body heat like a natural thermal battery. It also wicks away moisture from the skin, and with the soft layer, it keeps them warm and comfortable while they sleep. They used muskrat or ptarmigan fur, which was one of the softest options you could find in the freezing Arctic. Inuit sleeping bags come with a fur-in design, which means that the fur faces inward. This allows the Inuit to have direct contact with the fur, maximizing their heat retention. The outer shell faces out, so the windproof seal skin blocks Arctic gusts. The outer shell is larger than the lining, creating a space for insulation to loft naturally. The Inuit also use sinew stitching with animal tendons. These are called sinew, and they swell when wet, sealing gaps against drafts. The sinew is stronger than thread, and it won't rip under tension. Even at freezing temperatures of negative 64 degrees Celsius, negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the stitching remains strong, and it won't turn brittle like nylon. The Inuit were nomadic, which means that they were constantly on the move. This is a reason why they made sleeping bags, as it was easy to transport on sledges or skin boats as they hunted and searched for resources. If they built a tent, then they used the sleeping bags to get a good night's rest. In fact, the modern sleeping bags that we have today were copied from Inuit designs after explorers saw their efficiency. Even modern mummy bags owe their shape to Pascak innovations. Yet, the synthetic sleeping bags we have today are no match for the warmth-to-weight ratio that fur provides to the Inuit. The Inuit could sleep in negative 64 degrees Celsius, negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures, and stay warm without electricity. But with a two-layer armor system, the first layer of their clothes is the caribou underlayer. Caribou fur comes with hollow hairs, which act as microscopic heat tubes and it traps warmth five times better than goose down. As we've said before, caribou fur has natural moisture wicking, so the sweat evaporates instead of freezing. Sweating in the Arctic can lead to frostbite, as the sweat would literally freeze on your body. Plus, it's super light, so your outfit might not be as heavy as a ski jacket. The Inuit also follow the fur-in rule as all their clothes are worn with fur against the skin, and direct contact maximizes the heat capture. It's double-layered in extreme cold, and so two hides create dead-air insulation. Then there's the outer layer, which is usually made of seal skin. This makes all their clothes waterproof and windproof, as seal fur naturally repels water, and it blocks gusts that can cause you to freeze over. Some of their clothes come with a snug-fit hood, 
with wolf or wolverine fur trim, and adjustable flaps seal around the face so only their eyes are exposed. It protects their face from the freezing weather. Can you imagine going to sleep with your shoes? Well, the Inuit kept their feet warm by wearing their shoes and still sleeping with all their clothing on. You couldn't wear silk sleepwear in the freezing Arctic. They went to sleep with mukluks, which were soft boots that were made with multiple layers of fur and animal skin. It allowed them to sleep comfortably and still protect their feet since the shoes weren't heavy. Some Inuit also piled their clothes on top of their body when sleeping, especially in freezing weather, like a blizzard. This could trap warm air and further insulate them from the frigid temperatures. The Inuit also wore thick mittens up to three layers. The inner layer can be made from ptarmigan feathers, while the middle layer is made of caribou fur and the outer shell has a waterproof seal skin. The Inuit had to protect their babies from the freezing weather, and their parks often came with a built-in baby pouch that is fur-lined and windproof. The baby will ride inside while wearing an atayuk, a kind of jumpsuit made of caribou skin. This kept them warm as they shared body heat with their mother. How many layers of clothes do you think you would need to survive the Arctic? Drop your thoughts in the comments. For the Inuit, there was no electricity, but it was still no problem. The Inuit sleep comfortably in the Arctic freezing weather using high-fat fuel and a unique heating method that makes your electronic blanket look funny. One of their pre-sleep rituals is the stone bed warmer, which involves heating up basalt stones. After heating up the stone, which holds heat five times longer than metal, they wrap it with fur to slow up the heat loss so it stays warm for up to six hours. Then, they can place the stones by the feet or between the sleepers to keep everyone warm. Unlike your electric heater, it had no fire risk and it didn't require any batteries, so they could use it in any storm. It was also the perfect foot massager. One way the Inuit perfectly adapted to their freezing weather is the food that they eat. They mostly ate high-fat foods, which kept them warm from the inside and gave them more than enough energy to handle the freezing weather. The Inuit often ate seal blubber, which offers over 900 calories in a serving. It was pure, slow-burning fuel. Another Inuit meal was the whale muktuk, which is packed with vitamin C and omega-3s. Plus, they enjoyed eating dried caribou, but with three times the fat of jerky. The Inuit also melted ice for their water, as snow would lower their body temperature. When there was a blizzard, they enjoyed warm broths to prevent a cold shock. Could you eat seal blood soup? The Inuit enjoyed it just fine. Aside from eating heartily, the Inuit also keep warm with motion. They have to keep the blood flowing, so they engage in light exercise, and even when in the igloo, they keep on moving to prevent frostbite in their extremities. Wiggling their toes, moving their arms, and more can keep the blood flowing. They also engage in frostbite checks, which is why they never sleep alone. It's like having your very own sleeping buddy. They inspect the noses and the ears when they wake up to prevent freezing and keep the kids or elders in the middle which is the safest and warmest spot. The Inuit burn over 5,000 calories daily during the winter, which is three times the intake of a desk worker, just to stay alive. That's a lot of food for survival. No one sleeps alone in the Arctic, and that's why they've been able to stay warm without electricity or heat. Inuit don't just survive extreme cold, but they thrive by living as a single, interdependent unit. Their secret is communal living and generational knowledge sharing. In Inuit communities, there's no such thing as every man for himself. Food is always shared, and even the smallest catches feed the entire group. The clothing also rotates based on need, as all the women of the community will make the clothes and the best ones go to the hunters. Even the igloos are communal, and they sometimes combine multiple igloos into one for the extended family. Their communal living works because it prevents hoarding, and they always prioritize the children and elders. 
The elders are the knowledge carriers and have passed down information on how the future generations can remain warm despite the freezing weather. The skills have been taught through hands-on practice. So expect to see little boys and girls building mini igloos. They continue to pass down diverse lessons like the importance of frostbite checks before and after bed and the seal blubber lamps, which act as emergency heaters. It keeps warm, lights up the room, and can be used for cooking. The Inuit had flexible family structures to stay close to one another. They often adopted the orphans, so no children were without parents. They also had a practice of spouse swaps, which strengthened alliances, allowing them to learn about each other and more. Inuit communities worked with democracy, so everyone could contribute and make their lives better. Even women were seen as equals, and their knowledge was important to the growth of the community. While most Inuit now live in heated homes with Wi-Fi, traditional survival skills still save lives in the harshest conditions. The Inuit continue to sleep warmly at negative 64 degrees Celsius, negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures today. The Inuit still learn igloo building for when they're in the wild, and this is critical if storms strand them. Nowadays, you can see igloos with tarp liners to provide extra insulation. They now have GPS beacons to call for help if they're stranded in the winter, but igloos can prevent hypothermia while waiting. You might mostly see igloos in elder-led youth camps and those built by adventure guides that are leading igloo hotel tours. Adventure tourists pay a lot of money to sleep in igloo hotels, although these might have some heaters nowadays. They can't survive like the Inuit who mastered the weather without a single watt of electricity. The Inuit now combine the best of both worlds in their practices today, especially in their clothing. Now, high-tech meets caribou fur. Their outer layer is now made of modern windproof synthetics, which are easier to maintain. And then on the inner layer, they still use caribou fur liners because these remain unbeatable for warmth. As for their Kamek boots, they now have Vibram soles, but they still keep sealskin uppers. Inuit homes don't rely on Killick lamps anymore, but they have electric heaters. This keeps them pretty warm despite the freezing weather outside. But when there are massive blizzards, they might deal with blackouts. So some families still have backup Killick lamps, which burn seal oil for radiant heat and light. The Inuit still focus on eating high-fat food after all these centuries, especially since the Arctic remains cold. They still eat traditional staples, but they still have store-bought food, although it might be more expensive because it's not easy to import food into cold areas. Could you survive an Arctic night? Now you know how the Inuit sleep at negative 64 degrees Celsius, negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit without freezing. It's not just igloos, it's their raised beds, sleeping bags, clothing, food, and centuries of wisdom. So, would you try it? Let us know in the comments if you'd dare or tag someone who'd last five minutes. If you're fascinated by ancient survival hacks, hit subscribe and like. Thanks for watching and stay warm tonight.